morning, everybody. Very, very warm welcome to everyone this morning. And uh, welcome to Holy Sepulchre, the virtual church. And uh, for anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Ruth and I am one of the church wardens. Um, Luke will be leading us in uh, some sung worship in a few moments and Nick will be preaching to us very shortly. Um, but uh, just before we, we do that, let's open with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for this beautiful spring morning. We thank you for new life and new hope that comes at the beginning of the year. And Lord, we thank you that we have our ongoing hope in you and also this morning and in this season we have light coming out of a dark period of the pandemic lord we thank you that we are here together and able to give thanks for those things lord be with us all this morning lord Amen. Amen. So I'm going to hand over to Luke uh, for some uh, some worship this morning. Please remain muted so we can all enjoy uh, Luke and uh, uh, we can have a continuation on the sound. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be together. Um, I do hope you can hear yourself singing louder than you can hear me. Um, but it's a joy to be leading us in song worship this morning. Um, off the back of Ruth's prayer, why don't we continue in that, that kind of space as we turn our hearts to the Lord, as we fix our eyes on him, as we give thanks for his love and his grace in our lives. And as we were praying this morning, I just felt the Lord uh, stir us just to take a few moments to be still before him to rest in his presence holy spirit we thank you that you are with us let me just take a moment to be still and know that you are god in the midst of all that goes on around us the good and the bad we take a moment to be still and know that you are God. Excelling joy, our pale to earth come down, fixing us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown, Jesus, thou.
Lost in wonder, love, and praise. Lost in wonder, love, and praise. God, we choose this morning to lift our eyes to you, to fix our gaze on Jesus. turn our hearts to the love of the Father and to be aware of the Spirit in us. God, would you stir praise and thanks and worship in our hearts today? Would you ignite wonder in us again as we worship you? I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. Oh, I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I Yeah. 
the King is alive. Oh, he is high and lifted up. Yeah, the King is alive. Yeah. Oh, yes, the King is alive. Yeah. Say, My God is mighty to say, He is mighty to say, forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing, then mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save, forever, author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave, take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Everything I believe in, yeah, now I surrender all to you, Lord, all to you, Savior. He can move the mountains, my God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save. the risen King, Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see, we're singing for the glory of the risen King, yeah. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to say, He is mighty to say, forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. He rose and conquered the grave. Yes, Jesus conquered the grave. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave.
Jesus, we stand in awe of you, of all that you are, all that you've done, all that you're doing in your world. And we surrender ourselves to you afresh today. We give you our lives and we say, have your way. Speak to us, we pray today. God, would you open our ears and our hearts Spirit, would we know your encouragement and your inspiration, but also your challenge that changes us more and more into the people that you would have us be. We ask it for your kingdom and for your glory. Amen. 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 Thank you, Luke. Thank you very much. Welcome to anybody who's joined the service uh, while we were worshipping together there. Very, very warm welcome to everybody. I hope everybody is well on this beautiful sunny morning. Isn't it nice to have some good weather? A bit more heat wouldn't go amiss. I'm sure uh, many of you agree, but uh, you know, let's be thankful. It's uh, nicer to be out in the sunshine than it is to be out in the rain. But it's nicer still to be together. And here we are together this morning in our way. Um, so Nick is going to be speaking to us in just a moment and um, I am going to read this morning's passage which comes from Luke chapter 16 and I'm going to be starting at verse 19. I think we have uh, a slide. Here we are. Marvellous. Thank you Rachel. Um, here we go. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Loving God, open our hearts and minds to your word and give us the strength and courage to be and do all that you ask of us. Amen. I don't know if anyone saw the documentary a couple of years ago about class distinction in the UK. It was looking at whether the terms of working class and middle class and upper class were still relevant and used in the UK. And there was one particular moment where the film crew were in a rundown inner city council block of flats. And they were talking to a young teenage mother and they asked her what class she was. And she replied, definitely middle class. And they said, are you certain? And she replied, I can't be working class as I don't have a job. And I say that not in any way to uh, uh, 
mock the the young lady involved but it's interesting how the class system has evolved in this country and I wonder if we did a similar survey today but rather than asking about a question about class we focused on whether people saw themselves as rich or poor what would those results be and I wonder how we see ourselves, particularly compared to the rest of the world. What measure of rich and poor we should use. The World Bank uses a poverty line of $1.90 as one measure of poverty. And that at or below that level, there are 700 million people representing 9.5% approximately of the world's population. And perhaps sadly, for the first time in 20 years, that number has gone up by 100 million. In my secular job, some of you know, I focus on banking for the unbanked in the Middle East. And in the world, there are 1.8 billion people who are unbanked, and of which the majority of those are living in not just poverty, but oppression. They don't mostly not have a bank account because they don't see them as important. A good proportion of them do not have a choice, whether that's be through the oppression, removal of documents by the systems or families around them, or other situations much worse. And so whatever measure we use, do we see ourselves as rich or poor? In our reading from Luke, we heard the rich man being told, remember that in your lifetime you received good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. I suggest that our reading from Luke today is not necessarily about our monetary riches though, or even about the broader riches we have, including our possessions and skills and gifts. But our reading today is much, much more. It is about who we are and how we live our lives. It is about our concern, our compassion and complicity in a broken, fallen world. Our concern to notice and even seek out those in need. Our compassion in using and sharing all that we have at our disposal for the benefit of all in God's created world. And our complicity in maintaining the status quo of rich and poor and haves and have nots. In reality, a very binary decision about who we are and how we live our lives, about whether we place our trust in God or in our earthly ability to do what we need for ourselves. As I commented, it isn't, I suggest, about financial riches, but it can be. And it can be, though, easy to attack the more well-off in this country and suggest that they have had their treasures on earth, suggest that they don't make sacrifices, that they don't understand the cost of discipleship. The very many stories across the breadth of society this week, though, emerging of the life of His Royal Highness, I believe offer each of us an example of what it means to be a disciple, to be in the service of God. And as part of our memorial to him. I just wanted to share a few extracts of the Archbishop's statement this, that was made on Monday in the House of Lords paying tribute. He said, there are some rare people who bring energy to a room. The Duke of Edinburgh had a profound moral imagination, extraordinary foresight and even vision. He did not see the world just as it is, but as, it, as what it could be and what it should be. 
he had an instinctive sense that the social contract was found in the traditions we inherit from the past, in our obligations to the present, and in our responsibility to those yet to be born. His genuine and deep sense of humility and service came from, I think, the same place as faith. He had a sincere Christian faith, absolutely untainted by false piety, formed and developed by wrestling with great issues, refined by meeting such an extraordinary variety of people. And the Archbishop finished off by saying, his service was a profound expression of his own faith. He knew who, who he was and his faith was central to who he was and how he lived his life. He worked out his call to serve and follow Christ in the context of his own unique calling, his life, his family, his work. These formed his vocation. Yet he was always utterly true and authentic to himself. That mixture is a lesson for us all. I would just encourage each of us to challenge ourselves when we read the stories of the royal family to sometimes see past what we see first. And it is easy at times to see riches and not see service, not see sacrifice. So I want to now bring us back to our reading from Luke and for each of us to explore who we are in this story. In the first scene in Luke, Jesus tells us about a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. Not luxury on special occasions, but luxury every day. A man not just prosperous or well off, but enormously wealthy, living like a king. And Jesus tells us about a beggar named Lazarus, who was laid at the rich man's gate, covered in sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Although the only bit of relief he had comes from the dogs licking his sores. However, in the next scene, Jesus tells us they both died and Lazarus is carried by angels to Abraham's side, whereas the rich man on the other hand ends up in hell where he begged for even one drop of water to cool his tongue. And we have, again, one of the most wonderful reversals of fortune. Paradoxes of rich and poor, of haves and have not that we often hear Jesus tell us. And as Abram says, in your lifetime you received good things, which La while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted and you are in agony. And Jesus' challenge to the Pharisees and the scribes and to each of us is to look at our lives and ask, are we living a life according to the scriptures? Are we noticing the Lazarus at our own door? who is in need of the abundant gifts God has given each of us. The rich man's sin wasn't his wealth. And it wasn't even that he did something particularly wrong. It was just that he did nothing. He did nothing to ease the situation and nothing to change the situation. He and therefore us in our dealing with our own Lazaruses have to realize that by doing nothing, we are complicit in maintaining the situation. William Barclay, the Scottish theologian, titles this reading, The Punishment of the Man Who Never Noticed. Are we showing the concern and compassion that Jesus teaches us? Or are we complicit in maintaining the status quo? Lazarus was at the rich man's door and he didn't notice. Who is at our door that we don't notice? Data from the United Nation indicates that around the world, there are 750 million who do not have clean water. 2.5 million who don't have access to clean sanitation. 24,000 dying each day from hunger. 
or causes related to hunger. Every two days, the population of the square mile dies around the world. And closer to home, we're told in the UK, 11 million people are classed as income poor in our country. And this week, our work with the Hygiene Bank in the Square Mile and the initiative we started, Generosity, we had another community partner approach us. So that takes us to 15 or 16 local charities, agencies in the Square Mile, desperate for hygiene products, desperate to help those living in poverty in one of the richest cities in the world, desperate to offer dignity and well being in the belief that it should be a basic right and not a privilege. I think at this point, it's easy to suggest it's the politicians front fault and get into aspects of it's somebody else's job to solve this and blame all the politicians of whichever party or either party. But given all the relative blessings and riches we have, our money, our possessions, our time, our ability to make a stand, can we really say that we each show the concern and compassion that Jesus teaches us? Or are we complicit in maintaining that status quo? Too easy to go through life putting on our own blinkers so that we only see what we want to see, shielding ourselves just in case. God calls us to change our ways. Today's reading is a request to each of us to look at our situation, how we live our lives, how we use the possessions and gifts that we have. Because there's going to be a time at the end of time when God is going to ask us, what did we do for the Lazaruses of this world? We are each the rich man in this story, provided by God with abundant gifts. We might not recognize them. We might not even know some of those gifts that we have, but God has a plan for each of us, for how he wants us to be, how he wants us to seek out those Lazarus, it's how he wants us to offer his hand of compassion. They may not be the abundant gifts and riches we want, but we are told they are sufficient for God's plans. Do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For your heavenly father knows what you need and all things will be given to you. It is for each of us to prayerfully discern what we're being called to do with the abundant gifts he's given us each of us to work out our role of concern and compassion for this world. How we are to have greater concern for others means we need to learn to not look the other way, but learn to notice and actively seek out those in need. We need to have greater compassion for others to share, not what we do not need or what we think is enough but share what the other needs without counting the cost and third we have to realize our potential complicity in creating and maintaining unjust structures in our society however small a contribution we can make every time we give that bar of soap is a gift of dignity to one individual. Every time we make that stand, one person's life will be made different. Mother Teresa said, it's very fashionable to talk about the poor. Unfortunately, it is not as fashionable to talk to the poor. Perhaps it is time we each ask the poor to join us at the feast at our table. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Um, that moves beautifully into our prayers of intercession uh, this morning. Um, Nick, I think there was one particular um, area of intercession that uh, that you were going to pray for for us, uh, and then I will move into our other prayers of intercession. Um, at the end of which, I'm going to leave a space, and if anybody feels moved to uh, to pray something uh, into that space, then please do, and then the Lord's prayer will appear on the screen, and uh, we can say that if you want to unmute yourselves and pray out loud then please do um, if you prefer to remain muted of course that's fine too Nick let us pray <laughs> loving God as we come to the end of this period of national mourning we pray for the Queen and the royal family Like many over this last year, have found times difficult for mourning. And mourning in public sight must be even more difficult. We pray that your care, your love, and your grace will pour over them, Lord. that they will feel the warmth of this nation for them, particularly at this time. And that they will know that we see a man who gave great service to many but he was also husband, father, grandfather, who will be missed. And therefore we pray, Lord, for all who mourn. In you, your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord God, we thank you for the reminder from this morning's passage that we should open our eyes to see the needs of those around us, Lord. Holy Spirit, we pray that you open our eyes to see the need and the lack around us in our everyday life. Lord, to raise our eyes and see through your eyes, to see the world as you would have it be. And Lord God, we pray that you open our hearts to act on that information. It's not enough just to see. You also stir us to action. Lord God, melt our hearts. Take away our hearts of stone and give us a heart of flesh. Holy Spirit, we pray. Lord God, we pray for another area of our world where we are very much above that poverty line. We pray for countries of the world where the pandemic is currently on fire and claiming lives, where health services are overwhelmed and on the brink of collapse. We pray for doctors and nurses and public servants in all sectors who are fighting a seemingly endless and unquenchable fire of disease. Lord God, we pray for them. We pray for strength. We pray for fortitude 
and courage. We pray for resources. We pray for energy. We pray for vaccines. We pray for machines. We pray for the things that they need to fight this unholy fire. Lord God, we think particularly at the moment of the people of India. We think of the people of Brazil, Lord. We pray for all the countries that are currently at the height of a surge. Lord God, we pray for the people of those nations. We pray for a lack of fear, Lord. We pray against the fear that grips the hearts of those who are surrounded by a disease that they feel unable, ill-equipped to fight. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on them. Lord God, we pray for all those in our country and those around the world who are in grief caused by the pandemic, people for whom yesterday's uh, funeral stored, uh, stirred up feelings of grief that may be hours old or decades old, Lord. We pray for them in their grief. We pray for them that they will be comforted, Lord. Lord God, if there are ways in which we should be moved to comfort those around us, Lord, we pray that you open our eyes to that and our hearts to that action also. Lord God, we pray that you would stir in us to be the comforters, to draw those into your presence to direct their gaze towards you. Holy Spirit, make us the comforters. Now, if anybody has anything that they would like to pray into this space, if you just unmute yourselves and speak, I leave a space. And we say together, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now I believe we have another slide with today's notices. Thank you, Rachel. So organized this morning, we have a notice of slide. Uh, just briefly before that slide comes up, one thing that isn't on the slide, uh, just in case anybody doesn't know, uh, Greg and Sophie Bannister had a little boy uh, this week. And uh, let me just double check his name. Uh, he was born on the 13th. I'm not sure what day that was. Was that last Monday? Was that Monday? Sunday? Anybody? Um, and uh, was born on uh, the 13th of April, weighing nine pounds, four ounces and he's going to be being called John Philip Bannister. I don't think that's anything to do with Prince Philip, but uh, you never know, it may be an homage to Prince Philip. Uh, so little baby 
baby banister arrived safely last week. I'm sure we're all very delighted to, and uh, would be like to congratulate Greg and Sophie on their new arrival. Um, other things coming up. So on Monday, uh, tomorrow, we have the continuation, I think it's a continuation of the Something Better course that is on Zoom, exactly where you are now between 5.30 and 6 o'clock. Uh, if you'd like more information, they are on the website at courses at hsl.church. Um, anybody want to say anything about that before I move on? Just to say, it's not the church login details, so you need to email to get the actual login details. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Rachel. That is uh, that is not what I've just said. So uh, there is a different login. So if you would like that information, please definitely check the website or email courses at hsl.church. And then coming up in about a month's time, we will be doing something called the wellness journey. Uh, we are going to be running the same thing. It's not it's not a two times a week commitment. It's once a week on Thursdays or on Mondays, uh, Monday in the evening, early evening tea time slot and Thursday lunchtime. Uh, I think the intention of that is that it will fit around a working uh, week. Um, and then even further, um, well, not actually even further ahead, uh, slightly less far ahead is on Sunday in two weeks time, we will be having the APCM, which um, uh, I'm for anyone not familiar with those initials, and there's no reason why you should be, that is the annual parochial church meeting. It is our once a year church business meeting, um, uh, starting immediately after the Sunday service on Zoom. I promise you it will be more interesting than that might initially sound. It will not be a long meeting and we do encourage everybody to stay. If anybody would be interested in uh, joining um, any standing for election, there are various elections that would take place there. Please do have a word with Nick. Um, and I think there's also some information in this week's church email um, about that. So please do check the weekly email. And if you don't get the weekly email, uh, please let somebody know um, and let them know. And it's on the website. <laughs> Yeah, okay, fantastic, thank you. I think that's everything, is that everything? I'm not getting any contradictions, so I think that's everything. So just before uh, I hand over to Luke for some closing worship, uh, let's just uh, bring it back together with a word of closing prayer. Father God, we thank you for your presence with us here this morning. We pray that your, your heart and your will will go with all of us this morning as we continue into our day and as we embark upon a new working week. Lord God, Lord, have mercy on us all, and may your presence go with us from this place. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Um, we are going to sing again as we finish today. And uh, just to throw us all, um, as, as Nick was uh, sharing, uh, just the words of When I Survey just kept kind of flowing through my mind. And um, uh, just think it's really great sometimes to just fix our eyes on the cross and to not rush away and to embrace all that Jesus did uh, for each of us, but also to, to redeem all of creation. Um, and as we do that, it stirs something in us. It, it stirs in us that sense of, of joining all that, that Jesus is about and doing in this world. So let, let's take a moment just to be still before we sing this. Do find the words in the chat um, and then Rachel will put up a final slide for us to sing our, our last song as well. Um, but if you found those words, you might just wanna read over them, just glance down through the verses. A friend of mine years ago said to me as we sang this song, when we talk about surveying the cross, it, it kind of implies a, 
a stopping and a lingering, not a, just a glancing look, but actually taking time to survey the cross. and all that Jesus gave. Let's sing together. Oh, Rachel, you've done a wonderful job. Bless you, let's sing together. You're all 
together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Jesus, we give you all the honour, all the praise, all the worship. And God, we give you our lives as an act of worship. As we partner with you, as we love and serve a broken world, knowing that you are the God of restoration and redemption, of new life, of new creation, of healing, of wholeness. So Jesus, as we walk with you, this week, into the coming days. Help us to be your hands and feet, your mouthpiece, walking in step with the Spirit. That we might see your kingdom come and your will be done. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Luke.